Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. They can spend their life hating somebody that hurt, hurt them and trying to get them back, but it takes some courage to give those things to God. Go ahead and try to help as many people as you can and watch God be your vindicator in life. Come on. The painless path is not the best one to look for. Because even if you found it, you wouldn't find that it will take you where you want to go. We like quick fixes, don't we? Our prayers often, Lord, make me patient and please do it in a hurry. <laughs> I think this is good. You know, a mushroom can grow overnight. Has anybody ever one day your yard looks fine and the next day you got a bunch of mushrooms in it? But a large oak or a giant sequoia takes a long time. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be a mushroom or a giant tree of righteousness? We got a lot of mushroom Christians. <laughs> Come on. There's no scripture in the Bible that compares us to a mushroom. But Jeremiah 17, 8 says, For he will be nourished like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out its roots by the river, and it will not fear the heat when it comes. But its leaves will be green and moist, and it will not be anxious or concerned in a whole year of drought, nor will it stop bearing fruit. Now, come on, that's what God wants. Not a mushroom that pops up overnight and somebody comes along and mows down. He wants us to be people that, have, that are rooted and grounded in God. I mean, he wants people that have gone deep in God, deeply rooted and grounded in Christ and in his love and in the principles in the word of God. Therefore, when there's a storm going on in your life, you're getting your nourishment from something that other people can't see because you've got roots that are somewhere that are still drawing nourishment that keeps you bearing fruit. Come on, in a whole year of drought, you don't stop bearing fruit because you're not getting your life source from your circumstances. You're getting it from something deeper than that. Do you want to be a mushroom or a tree of righteousness? You can get a bumper sticker and throw it on your car and hang a cross around your neck. Get the Battlefield of Mind Study Bible and carry it around with you. But the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. Amen. Can you keep bearing fruit in a whole year of drought? When things aren't going good for you, how long does it take for you to get grouchy with other people? How many of you know what a geode is? Okay, not too many. Well, this is what it is. Now, you know, that's about as unattractive as anything would be. God made that. I don't, wow. Well, you know what? That's kind of the way most of us are on the exterior. You can be a Christian and your exterior still look like that, but that's what's inside, see? So, I think that's such an amazing example. It's like, God, you gotta be kidding. How can something look that bad on the outside and look that good on the inside? And see, when Jesus comes into our life, all this is taken care of. But what the Holy Spirit's now doing now is trying to work what's in there to out here where the world can see it and get some good and benefit from it. Well, it's going to be a little painful when he starts chipping away this stuff. But he's after the good stuff. You can take the table, Matt. Diamonds are one of the most precious jewels in the world. People pay big money for good quality diamonds. 
But you know, diamonds are farmed very, very slowly, sometimes over thousands of years. They're buried in the earth or in mountains, and they become diamonds because of high temperatures under great pressure while they're in the depths of the earth. Do you hear what I said? If you want to be a diamond for God, it's going to take high temperatures and great pressure. <laughs> a few nights in the fiery furnace. Too many people are parked. They park at the point of their pain and they just stay there all their life. Well, my dad abused me and I've never gotten over that. Well, you could. You could not only get over it, you could use it. Did you hear me? You can not only get over it, you can let God use it. Every single thing you go through that's hard, you can get something out of it if you want to. You know what? Most everybody who hires somebody wants somebody with experience. They'd actually rather have somebody with experience than somebody that just has education and no experience. <laughs> so you can read the Bible, but until you have to apply those principles in your life, you have no experience. The Bible even talks about Jesus in Hebrews 5, and it says that the things that he experienced qualified him to be our Savior. The things that he went through qualified him to become our high priest. Because now he identifies with any pain that you have. He understands it. If you want to help people, you're going to have to go through some stuff. You believe what I say because I tell you what I've been through. And so I don't have to tell you, I think this will work. I'm telling you, I know that it will work. I didn't just read the book. I've applied the principles. And I can tell you, for example, one of the greatest things that you'll ever do in your life is forgive people, completely forgive people who have hurt you. Now that takes some courage. Anybody can spend their life hating somebody that hurt, hurt them and trying to get them back, but it takes some courage to give those things to God. Go ahead and try to help as many people as you can and watch God be your vindicator in life. Come on. Don't just be some old regular normal person that just acts the way everybody else acts. Let's be better than that. Let's let Jesus be glad that he paid for our freedom because we're actually doing something with ourselves. Amen? Whatever you're going through right now, anything you're going through right now, it may not seem fair, it may not be fair. The Bible never really says that life is fair, but it says that God is a God of justice. And that means that he makes wrong things right. That's one of my favorite character traits of God is that he's a God of justice. I love to preach on that because I've watched God take wrong things that were done to me and work them out for my good. But if you want that to happen today, you've got to have a turnaround attitude change. Today, you say, this is the last day that I blame my problems on somebody else. This is the last day that I'm going to waste feeling sorry for myself. This is the last day that I'm going to spend being bitter and full of unforgiveness. I'm going to try it God's way. Come on, I'm gonna try it God's way. And see what happens. Don't look for that painless path. 
I was driving down the street one day and I saw a no parking sign, no parking at any time. And right away when I saw that, God gave me a message title. And for me, a lot of times when I get a title, the message comes right after it. And I thought, you know, that's what people do. They park at the point of their pain and they stay there. See, I could still be parked back where I was when I was 18, being bitter and resentful and controlling and manipulative and not trusting anybody and never being able to maintain a good relationship. But because I tried it God's way, I'm here today helping you. And, you know, the Israelites were in a pretty good sized mess. God was delivering them from Egypt and they got into a tough place. They had the Egyptian army at their back and the Red Sea in front of them. And uh, they're crying out to Moses and Moses is crying out to God and in Exodus 14, 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. So I got a word for you today. Stop just sitting around crying and moaning about your past and what you haven't had and what people have done to you and haven't done for you and just start moving forward. Come on. Get your life out of park. It's time to go somewhere. You know, Saul was anointed king, and Samuel had put a great deal of time into Saul's life. He was the one that anointed him, and I'm sure there was a lot of mentoring going on there and training him, and Saul turned out sour. He right away showed rebellion toward God and thought that he didn't have to do exactly what God told him to do. He could just do a little bit of what God told him to and a little bit of what he wanted to. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, that's not going to work. You can't do a little bit of what God tells you to do and a little bit of what you want to do and ever end up with what God wants you to have. With God, it's all or nothing. So, if you've been trying to compromise with God and do some of what he tells you to do and some of what you want to do, then today would be a good day to make a decision that you're going to have to either go all the way with God or just probably not go anywhere at all, you know? Way back 40-some-odd years ago, before I was really having much opportunity to teach, I had a small home Bible study, and I didn't know anything, and God was calling me to do something big, and I didn't have the education for it. I couldn't stop what I was doing and go off to Bible school at that time. I already had three kids, and, and uh, I needed to study. And I, couldn't, I, I didn't have time to study because I had a full-time job, three kids, a husband, and we were committed in our church. And so I kept feeling like God wanted me to quit my job, and that seemed kind of dumb because our income would have been less than our bills. And you know, you normally don't quit your job if you got more bills than you got income. You normally keep it. But I kept feeling like I was supposed to quit, kept feeling like I was supposed to quit. And trust God, there was only about a $40 a month gap. If I quit working, then God would have to do a $40 a month miracle for us to pay our bills. And that wasn't counting anything extra, but that was just to barely make it. And Dave was in agreement if you feel like that's what God wants you to do. Sometimes I want Dave to tell me to do or not to do something, and he'll just say, well, you got to do what God's telling you to do. <laughs> so here's the funny story. I quit my full-time job, and I got a part-time job. <laughs> Come on, now there's a message here. I look back, and I think, how funny. I was trying to obey God and still take care of myself. But see, God wanted to put me in a position where I had to trust him because he wanted to use that time in my life to prepare me for this time in my life where if you knew the amount of money we have to trust God for now every week, 
Oh my gosh, I stopped counting a long time ago. Everybody claps when we say we're on television in two thirds of the world. Well, yeah, you ought to pay that bill. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to know where to get that. But God taught me how to trust him for $40 a month. But I didn't want to have to do that. See, we don't want to have to trust God all the way. We want to trust God, but we've always got a little backup plan. Come on. Got a little backup plan there just in case God don't come through. So I got myself a part-time job. And it didn't take God very long to let me know he meant business because I got fired from my part-time job. <laughs> and I was not the kind of employee that ever got fired from a job. I mean, I was a hard worker. I was good at what I was doing. And I got fired. So it became very obvious to me that God said, quit. So you can't do part of what God tells you to do and part of what you want to do. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. Come on, if you want to have that upgraded life that you say you want to have, then you got to make a decision today. Today is the day where I decide to go all the way with God. I'm not going to be a Christian on Sunday and then go back to being a sinner on Monday. Not going to be a Christian when you're with your Christian friends and then be a not-so-Christian when you're with your not-so-Christian friends. Make your mind up. If you lose friends, you're sticking with God. If you lose your job, you're sticking with God. If family members turn against you, you're sticking with God. Come on, if you're serious about this, there may be a little price you're going to have to pay. Salvation's a free gift. Victory requires you making some sacrifices sometimes. Do you mean it? So Saul got himself in trouble and God decided, nope, you're not the right king. And so he lost his opportunity to be king and it really hurt Samuel because he'd put so much time into his life. And so he was mourning Saul. This prophet Samuel was mourning over Saul. And in 1 Samuel 16, 1, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve for Saul when I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have chosen a king for myself from among his sons. Now, here's the message I get out of that. Okay, that didn't work out. How long are you going to mourn over what didn't work? I've got a new plan, God's saying. Come on, I'm talking to you. Some of you are mourning over what didn't work out, but God's got a new plan. Somebody ought to shout about right now. Okay, you lost that. You've had your time of mourning. Now it's time to get it out of park because I've got a new plan. Can I tell you something? God is never without a plan. And if you messed up plan A, plan B can be better than plan A ever was just because it's God. Woohoo! God created us to be people that are always moving forward, never going backwards. God uses very ordinary people to do extraordinary things. But you got to go all the way through with God. You can't park somewhere that's convenient. Not halfway through. Not some obedience and some disobedience. In Genesis 11, 31 and 32, Terah, who was Abraham's father, says, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together to go from Ur of the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan, the promised land. So God told Abraham's father to go there before he told Abraham to go there. 
I wonder how many people God has to go through before he finally gets a hold of somebody that'll obey him. Did you hear me? Maybe you've got an opportunity in front of you right now and you're not the first person that's been offered that opportunity. But when God wants to get something done, he'll get it done. What did Esther's uncle say to her? God will deliver his people and he's given you the opportunity. But if you won't do it, know this, God will deliver by somebody else's hand. But how do you know but that you were raised up for such a time as this? Anyway, Terah took Abram and Lot and Sarai, and he headed for Canaan. But they came to Haran, about 550 miles northwest of Ur, and they settled there. <laughs> Come on, some of you have settled. You've settled for a lot less than what you started out for. Is anybody awake out there? Well, get this. Terah lived 250 years there, and Terah died in Haran. He died where he parked. I saw a movie I'm going to recommend to you called The Lady in the Van. Anybody see that movie? Nobody in here saw that movie? You saw it. Okay. I watched it twice. This, it's based on a true story. And it's about a lady who actually died where she parked. <laughs> and this is a true story. Her name was Miss Shepherd. She was a homeless vagrant, lived in a yellow van for 15 years in London in a man's driveway named Alan Bennett. Now, she used to just park her van wherever she could, and she lived out of that van, but... She found out she could get some assistance, some government assistance, if she had an address. But she didn't have an address, so she talked this guy into letting her park in his driveway. It's what was supposed to be for a few weeks, and she ended up staying there 15 years. <laughs> and um, why did she live like that? Well, she'd been hurt real bad when she was young. She had actually really loved God, and she joined a convent. And the sister that was in charge of the convent took a dislike to her and was really mean to her. And she, she was a great piano player. I mean, had a tremendous gift for piano. The sister that was in charge of the convent told her that it was something that God wanted her to sacrifice and took it away from her and wouldn't let her play and it just broke her heart. She just was never really the same after that. She... When she left the convent, she bought this old beat-up van and she painted it yellow at some point and she was driving and she hit a man crossing the street and killed him and it became like a hit and run because she got scared and ran. And she spent her life broken-hearted and feeling guilty living in this van being not totally mentally sound. And so when she finally died, she died in that van in the driveway. And the fictional part of the story shows her going to heaven. And the first person she meets when she gets to heaven is this guy who she had killed. Now listen to this. And, she, and so she'd spent her whole life, ruined her life, feeling guilty and he says to her, by the way, it wasn't your fault that I died. You didn't hit me. I stepped out in front of you on purpose. So I just wonder how many of you have spent your life feeling guilty and bad about something that wasn't your fault. <laughs> Come on now. Now, how many years did I wonder what was wrong with me that caused my dad to abuse me? What was wrong with me? Why didn't my mother love me enough to get me away from him and rescue me? It wasn't my fault. 
There was nothing wrong with me. If somebody mistreated you, it's not because something was wrong with you. Well, did, did my husband leave me because I wasn't pretty enough or I wasn't skinny enough or if I would have been a better this or a better that? Let me tell you something. When people mistreat you, it's not because there's something wrong with you. It's because there's something wrong with them. And today's a day for you to make a turnaround and say, I'm going to stop feeling bad about myself because somebody rejected me. I'm going to stop feeling bad about myself because somebody mistreated me. I'm getting my life out of park. I've been parked at my pain long enough. I'm getting my life out of park. I want an upgrade. I want the best life that God can give me. And it's time for me to go forward. Well, don't be someone who just parks at the point of their pain and stays there the rest of their life. Keep moving through whatever it is you're going through until you reach the freedom that God intended for your life. Receive emotional healing and allow God to use your experience to help someone else. Eh, lo hacía escondida de todo, pero yo con 13 años lo pillé. También escuchaba cómo a veces él le pegaba. Entonces, eh, si bien mi mamá siempre trató de mantener la familia como en secreto, esas cosas. Que, no, que era fea, que, no, que nadie me pescaba que no había esperanza en mí, que mis manos eran feas, mi cara. Me miraba al espejo y lloraba. Dos veces traté de ahorcarme. Well, at Hand of Hope, the outreach arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, we are honored to work alongside Teen Challenge to help people break the chains of addiction and to see all that God has created them to be. Patricia and Norbert, would you begin by telling us about the need for a home like this here in Chile? Mm -hmm. Well, we have uh, the situation with uh, the women growing up in atmospheres where men abuse them. And through that abuse, women are turning to drugs like never before. The men beat them up, they turn them into slaves, they make them do the drug runs. And so they are afraid to, st to step out. They are afraid to go back to their families. It's a nine to 12 month program. We have a curriculum that gives them step by step discipleship in which they can grow in Christ. Once they're mature enough, they are reunited with their children. And when they live that dream of being free from drugs and being free from those things that cause them to turn to drugs, then they can be the mother that they need to be. Jimena, you are such an important part of all of these women's stories because of the way that you play a huge role in their healing. What are some of the particular troubles that women are dealing with? La necesidad de amor, del abrazo familiar, del abrazo de alguien que te ama, lo que buscan, lo que necesitan, lo que transforma. Porque mis manos eh, son instrumento de Dios. Y esta es mi familia. Ellas son mis hijas. Cuando supe que Él me perdonó, a pesar de que le hacía daño también a la gente al vender droga, eso me, me sentí súper porque alguien me amaba así como yo era. You said before that you couldn't even stand to look in a mirror because of how ugly you felt. 
What do you see now? Cuando estoy trabajando, mucha gente se acerca a mí y me dice, oh, su sonrisa, usted tiene algo especial. A ver qué es especial. Y una vez me detuve y miré al espejo, pero miré mis ojos. Y me dijo, yo hice esto. Y era mi rostro. What an amazing privilege to see the way that these women are blooming, the way that the beauty that God has put in them is now coming out so that they can see it. And when you help a woman, it flows over into her children, into her families, and it changes so many lives. That is what Project Girl is all about, sharing the beauty. And you can do that with us right here in Chile, as we've been talking about, and in many, many places all over the world. Have you ever wanted to help hurting people, but you feel like you can't make a difference? I want you to know that you can. When we work together, we can feed hungry children, rescue women from human trafficking, and help victims of natural disasters. Uh, that's just few of the things that we can do. And I'm asking you, if you're not a partner with our ministry, I'm asking you to partner with us, to become a financial partner with the ministry. And that means that you do something on a regular basis, monthly or, or quarterly, but we need people all over the world helping us so we can keep reaching hurting people. And honestly and truly, what each one of us can do by ourselves is minute compared to what we can do if we put it all together. And so I'm inviting you to join the family today and make an amazing difference all over the world for God's glory you can be a world changer. Well, we're all getting older every day, but you know what? Age is just a number. Getting old is a mindset. I wish that someone would have told me when I was 20 or 30 the things that I'm trying to tell you in this book. I share with you some things that I've gone through personally and the things that I believe I could have done that would have helped me to avoid some of those more painful things. Let me help you age without getting old. Besluit om bewust te genieten van je leeftijd. En ontdek wat je vandaag kunt doen om je morgen jong te voelen. Bestel dit boek door te bellen met 026 20 22 100 of online via joyce-meyer.nl/shop. Al ontdekt bemoedigende gedachten voor elke dag. Joyce Meyer Nederlands. Het bekijken waard.